Okay, well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Natalie. Um, I'm married to Pastor Bill. And um, before we get started, I think I just, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So uh, one thing that you might not know about me, I love paper. I love school supplies, July. Like, it bothers me a little bit that all the school supplies show up on July 5th. Like, could you just wait a little bit, Walmart? Like, give us a couple more weeks of summer. <laughs> but I am ready. I am all about the pens and the paper and the sticky notes. Give me all of it. I have a bag full of pens. I just love it. So um, so I'm going to be going old school today because I like paper. I get lost in the digital world, and I, I, would, I can't do the whole techie thing. I know Bill's got that down, but I just can't do it. So you'll have to forgive me. I love my paper Bible. Um, I do like the Bible app. It's super handy for pulling up, you know, if you know a word or two from a verse and you're trying to figure out where it is. Awesome. But I am, I tend to go old school. So I have all my, you can see all my sticky notes in here. So I'll do my best to flip and be ready to go um, as we go through our scriptures this morning. Um, I also love the women of the Bible. I have uh, I have loved the story of Ruth since I was a very little girl, and the church that I grew up in had a theater department, and the director wrote a whole production on Ruth and Naomi. So I love the story of Ruth. I love Rahab and Deborah in the Old Testament, and, um, and in the New Testament, of course, we have Mary, the mother of our Savior. And I was thinking about her as I was thinking about Mother's Day, and um, wanting to kind of celebrate moms and women. And I thought, oh my goodness, have you ever thought about how God, our father, entrusted a 13-year-old girl with the Savior, with, with the Savior of everyone? I mean, he trusted a little girl with this knowledge and this this incredible task, and um, and wow, I mean, she she lived up to it. She was able to do this incredible thing, and so as we take this day to celebrate moms, I want to celebrate all of us, all of us women, because I know in this room there are women who um, are mothers, and you've become a mother in a variety of ways. You gave birth, you adopted, you got married and inherited stepchildren. You have been foster parents. Um, and, and some of you are maybe not yet a mother in the true sense of the word. Someone on this earth has not called you mom yet. But I have watched many of you encourage and mentor other young women and children, youth. And so I just want to celebrate all of you, all women today. So we've got plenty of gifts on your way out. Mom or not, go ahead and snag one. Um, there's coffee and tea in them. And so one is coffee, one is tea. Take your pick. Um, but it's just a fun gift to celebrate women. Um, I want to take a look at a particular woman in Scripture today. And so if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, Bible app, or reference the screen, whatever uh, is convenient to you, whatever you prefer. I'm going to go, we're going to start in Luke 20, verse 45. So at the very end of Luke 20, we're going to find um, a few little Scriptures where Jesus is talking to his disciples, and then we're going to contrast it with the beginning of Luke 21. So I'm going to go ahead and read those scriptures for us. So Luke 20, verse 45. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples. Okay, I'm going to pause there really quick. Um, super pro parenting tip right there. Jesus was talking to his disciples. So you would think that everything he was about to say was just for his disciples, except he knew that other people were listening. So, and he knows people, he knows, um, and children in particular. If you want your kids to get something, try not saying it to them 
but saying it to someone else while they're in earshot, right? Because they tend to uh, pick up peripheral maybe a little bit better. They hear what we, they don't hear what we say to them, but maybe they hear what we say about them. So Jesus knew that, and so he is really, he's speaking to everyone in the, in the area. They're sitting in the temple gates, but he decides, I'm going to talk to my disciples and tell them this important stuff, but I know everybody else is listening too. So, um, so I found that kind of interesting. Um, so he says to his disciples and everybody else, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Now chapter 21, he, um, it continues. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So here's this little woman, and we only know a couple of facts about her. We know that she is a widow and that she's poor. And that she has one main action that is pointed out. She brings her gifts to the temple treasury. And let's just think about this. She doesn't have a name because she's frankly probably not very important. She's a widow. Widows in biblical times were burdensome. They um, required being cared for by either relatives or the community at large. And so um, Jesus takes the time to point out this poor widow to his disciples and those that were sitting in the, in the temple gates. And I, I wondered why. You know, we use, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about the widow's might, and that's the, the coins that she brings, and they usually in reference to the offering or bringing your, um, your gifts. But I think there's so much more that we can learn from this unnamed widow. We, I believe that Christ highlighted her in that moment as a very key contrast between what the world values and what he values. And so today, I want to encourage us, all of us, because I think these are principles that we can um, all learn from, not just moms. Um, I'm Obviously, given Mother's Day, I'm probably going to reference moms and all the hard work that we do and the sacrifices that we make. But it is definitely, these are values that we all can, um, can learn from. So let's dive right in. In verse 46, it says very specifically that the teachers of the law like to walk around in flowing robes and, um, and be greeted in the marketplace. So the world values appearances while God values attitude. We have a tendency to value what we look like, what we um, appear to other people like. You know, I used to watch that PBS um, British show, Keeping Up Appearances. Do you remember? Um, anybody know what I'm talking about? Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bouquet, I think was her name, except it's Buckets. They're the buckets. And she was so worried about how other people would perceive her that she wanted to be known as Mrs. Bouquet. So it was just a fun, funny, but I mean, the name of the show, Keeping Up Appearances, is something that we all do. And there's nothing wrong with looking nice or fixing your hair, um, but it becomes a problem when we value what we look like or how we appear to other people over our inner heart and our attitude. And um, I think that's really hard right now with social media, right? We have a tendency, I, I know I do, I put out the very best of who I am on Facebook and Instagram, and I'm not about to show you, um, you know, the photos of me with very little to no makeup. I think I did on Christmas morning, 
But I, you know, that doesn't happen very often, right? Because I want people to think that maybe I've got it all together. And I see all the other women on Facebook and Instagram, and, you know, they've made bountiful feasts for their family and everything looks perfect and the kids show up to church with matching outfits and um and I'm like um did Liam's shoes get here do we have shoes are we all (laughs) did we remember everything we need for the day so I want people to think that I've got it all together but I don't and I know the reality is that most of us don't but we compare ourselves to these false images that we see and create in our minds that aren't necessarily reality. Moms, I know um, that a lot of us have our thing. Like we have a mom thing that we really like. We kind of take pride in something specific that we, um, that we like and we maybe do really well. So one thing might be maybe you're the mom who throws elaborate birthday parties. This is your jam doesn't matter what it takes, you are super excited about the birthday party, okay? Um, Maybe there's a holiday tradition that you're really into and you do, or you want to be the snack mom, you've you've got all these great snacks, or whatever it is. Does anybody know what my my mom thing is? My family can't answer. Anybody? What do I, nobody? Aha, (laughs) Heather knows. I do Halloween costumes. And if anyone, I think Bill maybe once or twice suggested that I would buy them. Um, No. So we got Max from Where the Wild Things Are and Fancy Nancy. We got a couple little pirates. What else do we have? Oh, there's uh, Frodo Baggins and Stella Luna. We went through our book phase for a while where we were book characters. Luke and Leia. Really, those I had to redo one of those twice. I didn't quite get it. But the thing about... Ah, ducky. Um, John Cryer tweeted that. I tweeted it out, and John Cryer liked my tweet. Um, I haven't done uh, Twitter since then because you just can only go downhill from there. So this is my thing. I love doing Halloween costumes for my kids. But I'm telling you, (laughs) um, my family may not love it as much as I do because um, I tend to go a little bit overboard and um, the final image of the costume, as you can see, is adorable, right? They look great. The process, and maybe my attitude of the process, is, leaves a little to be desired. I think as I was telling Melanie about this before, um, she was like, oh, yeah, like how many times have I had to stand there with my arms out for 45 minutes? And you're like, stand still, I'm pinning. <laughs> and then I'm like, I said 45 degree angle, not 90. <laughs> so... I maybe need to check my attitude a little bit, um, but, oh, yeah, she won an award for that one. She got, uh, that's Willy Wonka. Uh, Yeah. So it's my mom thing, and I'm going to do it, and poor Liam's just going to have to deal. The older kids are probably done with costumes at this point, but um, but God, God doesn't care as much about what we do, but maybe how we do it. And so he asks us, to to not focus like the world does on the appearance of something, but on our attitude. He asks us to keep our attitude in line with his attitude and, and, and honor him in how we do the things that we do. So moms, I just want to encourage you, and I know that he sees you when you empty the dishwasher and you you know, sweep the floor and you do the things around the house or you do the things that you think no one notices and no one cares about. And when you do them with the right heart, because you know that you're serving your family and you're serving your kids in a way that honors him, he sees it and he knows that it matters. And he asks us to to give our all to him so that our atif- our attitude will reflect Jesus. Okay. 
Um, in Matthew 23, 27, again, he gives us a contrast to those teachers of the law, those important people. And Christ says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of the law, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Don't be like that. And I'm looking across this room, and I know that there are moments when we feel really dead inside, where we feel we're struggling to have life and to give that life to our families. And in those moments, I encourage you to turn to Jesus, seek him first, and he will give you the strength that you need to continue. He will fill that dead space with his joy. He will fill that emptiness with purpose and value when you, when you seek him and you turn to him. All right. The world values importance, but God values integrity. The teachers of the law like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. The world values importance. We like to be seen with the right people, and God wants us to be doing the right things. So we're going to take a look in the Old Testament at another couple of people who demonstrate a strong value of integrity over importance. So when you go to Genesis 24 with me, and I'm going to paraphrase and kind of give you some background here as we start to dive into these scriptures. But in Genesis 24, we learn that Abraham, and he's the father of all of um, the Jewish people, he has decided that it's time to find a wife for his son, his only son, Isaac. And since they have been living in Canaan, he doesn't want him to marry a Canaanite woman. So he's going to send his chief servant back to his homeland, and the servant is going to pick out a wife for, Isaac's, for his son, Isaac. And the servant asks Abraham, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, so if I go and no woman will come back with me to Canaan, would it be okay if I grab Isaac and take him with me the next time? And then the girls will see Isaac and then they'll want to come with me. And Abraham refuses. He says, no, under no circumstances whatsoever should you take my son back with you. Because he's afraid that... Um, He's trying to control the situation because he's afraid that if Isaac goes back to their homeland, he's going to want to stay. But God promised Abraham and all of his generations to come that he would, that they would own the land of Canaan. And so he is trying to control this situation and make sure that Isaac stays in Canaan and starts to populate and create this, this legacy. And so... Um, so Abraham promises the, the chief servant, I, as a promise, I'll release you from your oath. So basically he says, it's okay. If you can't get a girl to come back with you, no problem. I, I got I you. Gotcha. I'm going to release you from your oath. But when you really think about what this man's job is, as the chief servant of Abraham, his life is serving his master. So if he's released from his oath to serve, he may not have a job. And I, I get the impression from the, the scripture here that he's, he's going to be okay. He's not going to be in trouble or anything. But this chief servant has made an oath and wants to serve his master. So he takes this task very, very seriously. So he gathers 10 camels and several other servants and a whole bunch of you know, goods and wares and things that he's proud of. Um, and they travel about 600 miles back to Abraham's homeland. So we're going to pick up in verse 12. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. Show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. 
let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had even finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. The woman was very beautiful. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. And the servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. That's key. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. So we're going to think about a couple of things here. First, this chief servant is super serious about his job, and he has the integrity to literally pray for God to give him a sign and show him who who he should ask to come be the wife of Isaac. He wants to do the right thing. He brings his all to this job, no matter how small or rather big. This this is a big deal, I would think. He knows that finding a wife for his master's son is no small task. But instead of doing what I think I would probably do and go to the city gates and seek out the, the flashiest, most important person, the most important man, and say hey, can I have your daughter uh, to marry my master's son? He has the integrity to seek out a young woman who also has integrity, to seek out someone who is humble. And so then we have Rebecca. It's evening time when the um, Israelite women would come to the, the well and draw because they're going to use that water to wash from their day's tasks and then have fresh water first thing in the morning when they wake. And so it's, we know that it's evening time, and um, we know that she's beautiful, but I am guessing she is a pretty strong woman here. She kindly gives a drink of water to a stranger, And then she goes a step further to water his camels until they have had enough to drink. And that phrase is really key. Camels are gross. Camels are disgusting, mean animals. They are not nice. And this guy has 10 of them. And they've just gone a 600-mile journey. And camels can drink and hold in their humps 30 gallons of water pretty sure that these camels were thirsty and tired. And um, I don't know if you know this. I had to look this up. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So we're talking about 10 camels, 30 gallons of water a camel at eight pounds a gallon. Um, This girl had some guns on her. (laughs) She is carrying 300 pounds of water back and forth to the trough to make sure that these camels are watered. This is diligence. This is integrity in the small things. Nobody wants to feed camels, not after a long day. She's already done a full day's worth of of work, and she has the integrity to to take the next step and do the hard job. Moms, all of us, He sees your integrity. He sees your diligence when you are wiping another nose or you're picking up another piece of clothing to put in the laundry. He sees your diligence. He sees your integrity to do the small tasks that seem like they don't matter, but they will. And they do. And he sees you. And he Your family loves you for it, even when they forget to say thank you, even when they forget to acknowledge it. But God is acknowledging it. He sees it. When the world values importance, our Father values your integrity and what you do when no one is watching. And um, Rebecca is an incredible, just this one little piece about her, seeing how she, she took the extra step and she did the hard stuff. And her reward, you know, she gets to marry Isaac. 
and, um, and she's honored in our scriptures. So be like Rebecca. All right. And lastly, the world values show, but God values sacrifice. Again, beware of the teachers of the law. They like flowing robes. Could we imagine Pastor Bill in flowing robes being greeted in Walmart, right? Um, no. <laughs> Some of us can. <laughs> um, they want to be seated at the places of honor at the banquets. Verse 47 is interesting. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. So we know that for the teachers of the law, for the Pharisees, it's about their appearance. It's about the show for them. Does, is everyone looking at me while I pray loudly? Is everyone noticing what I'm doing? In the next uh, section, they bring, their, um, they bring their riches to the treasury. And it's a show. It's all about being seen. And I think verse 47, verse 47 slips in this sneaky little phrase that I had to find out. What does this mean? Um, they devour widows' houses. So in those days, widows were burdens to the society, to their temple, to the community, because they had to be cared for. Um, we learned in the book of Ruth about how Naomi changed her name to Mara, meaning bitter, and tries to get her daughter-in-law, Ruth, to stay in Moab with her own people. And I think part of that is because she didn't want to return to Bethlehem as a burden herself, but also bringing with her another widow who is also going to be a burden. And so she, um, she tries to get her to stay. Now, Ruth is given the opportunity to glean from the fields and is shown that extra measure of kindness and is ultimately redeemed through Naomi's kinsman redeemer, Boaz. Um, and if you missed it, We've got all of the uh, Ruth series on podcast. You can look it up on whatever your favorite podcasting site is. So um, go check it out because that I love, I love the story of Ruth and Naomi, but I really liked our, our series from February. It was great. In that day, many widows were unable to work in the fields, and they maybe had no kinsmen to care for. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees would take advantage of them. And that's what this phrase means. They devour widows' houses. So they would literally buy the widows' houses for pennies on the dollar and leave them without an inheritance and without a safety net. And to think of people who are the leaders in the society and leaders in the, in the synagogue doing that, it goes counter to everything that Jesus teaches, Right? So the teachers would put on these big showy prayers to say how great they are, all the while they're taking advantage of the weakest members of society. And I'm guessing everybody pretty much knew that that was going on. I don't know that they were trying to hide it very well. But um, Jesus points this out very intentionally because he's, he's talking to them. Again, he's talking to his disciples and everyone else without them knowing. And he says they devour widows' houses because he can see out of the corner of his eye the wealthy and the rich that we see in, in chapter 21 bringing their, their gifts out of their wealth. And then he sees this widow and he knows he's going to point her out. And so he's, he, he draws that contrast. He shows that... Um, what they're doing, and they think they're doing it in secret and, and trying to cover it up with these big showy prayers, in contrast to this widow who brings everything she has to the temple tre treasury. She comes carrying her two tiny copper coins, all that she had, and gives it. And it says that she, she gave out of her poverty she put in all that she had. And I know that there is a monetary lesson here. There's something that we can learn about bringing our, um, our gifts to the storehouse and to, to give with a joyful spirit. 
And he calls us, he calls us to give, to decide in your heart, um, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly, for God loves a cheerful giver. But there's so much more to this than just her monetary gift. I know at points in my journey as a mother, as a woman, that I have felt in my soul impoverished. I have felt depleted and weakened and like I have nothing left to give and that even what I could muster up on my own, is it even worthy of giving? Is, is it even going to make a difference? Is it just two little copper coins that I'm throwing out to the world? And, and this specific scripture is so much more than a monetary thing. It's about giving out of our emptiness sometimes and saying, Lord, this is all I have left, but I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to honor you in the tasks and the journey that you've put me on. I'm going to take the gifts that you've given me, whether that's something that's really, um, you know, obvious, like those of us who can sing and maybe, or teach or, you know, or it, am I going to take the gift that's hidden, that's quiet, that maybe nobody notices? Um, I came here yesterday afternoon to study and finish preparing, and the church was clean and ready. I don't know who did that, but what a blessing. I never wonder or worry if church, the church building is going to be clean on Sunday mornings when I get here. Somebody is taking care of it. And I know it's many of you somebodies, but that is a gift. That's a blessing. That encourages Bill and I and, and gives us space to take care of other things in a way that is such a huge gift. And if you think that that goes unnoticed, I'm telling you right now, right here, it does not go unnoticed. So for those of you who clean our church <laughs> and make it ready, all the coffee cups were set out. Everything was perfect. And I just was so blessed by that because I didn't have to wonder or worry if it was going to be ready for everyone on Sunday morning. That's a hidden talent. That's a gift that God has given you to be an encouragement to the body of Christ. And it makes a difference. It matters. And so thank you whoever any and all of you are. It makes a difference. And, and so when you're giving out of that weakness, he is made great. He is glorified. And so, again, I, I encourage you and I remind you that when, um, when the rest of the world values a big show, God values your sacrifice. God values when you are up late with a little one or a teenager. God values when you are um, cleaning your home or cleaning the church. God values, values when you are making those sacrifices to put others first in a way that honors him. And so I want to thank you today. And, and I want to encourage you to continue in, um, in doing these little things that seem like they, they don't matter because they do. And, and he will sustain you. Our little gift today says that motherhood, powered by love, fueled by coffee or tea, your preference, but sustained by Jesus, right? It's the only way we're going to get through this life is being sustained through him. So thank you, moms. Thank you, women who are mentors and encouragers to all of us. Have a wonderful, beautiful day. And I'm going to close this out in prayer. Lord, thank you for this day to honor women. God, I know that you created us in your image as women with um, feminine, nurturing, loving characteristics that we can use to honor you. And so, Lord, I pray blessing over all of the moms and women in this room, Lord, that they would feel encouraged and supported today. And, Lord, we just pray for your blessings um, on our lives as we go through this next week and learning to serve you. And um, we just love you and praise you. Amen. <laughs>